Our next track is Getting Ready for America, uh, Getting Ready for Manufacturing in America, Reshoring, French Shoring, and to introduce the speakers is my dear friend, board member, colleague, we discovered our dads were in the same college, Preeta Ram, she's a professor, entrepreneur, and now an investor. Over to you, Preeta. Thank you, Anita. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's my privilege to introduce the next two speakers, but I'm hoping you were here yesterday to hear Naveen Chadda at, from Mayfield Fund because it ties to what he said. If you'll remember, and just as an introduction, Naveen Chadda said, and I quote, bring silicon back to Silicon Valley. Let's invest in, in semiconductors again. And that's where we're going to talk about. It is a great privilege to introduce Manish Patia, Executive Vice President of Global Operations at Micron Technology. You know, it ties right in there because we're going to be talking about semiconductors, bringing it back, and manufacturing. Manish, in addition to everything he does on a day-to-day -day basis at, at Micron in his leadership role, is enabling the return of the workforce and the return of manufacturing to our shores by partnering with the National Science Foundation and universities, um, launching curriculum, training the workforce that is needed to get the next gen of semiconductors and manufacturing back here. Now, Manish has been a leader in silicon, and I mean the element silicon, of course. Um, previously, of course, he was in other, um, he was at Western Digital. He's a deep tech man all the way from his early undergraduate career in mechanical engineering at MIT, followed by an MBA also at MIT. And here to talk to him about all these matters is Mark Patel. Mark is a senior partner at McKenzie and Corp in the San Francisco office. We're so delighted to have him here. He co-leads McKenzie's platform for, for climate technologies and leads work across, get this, sustainability, AI, IoT, semiconductors. He likes to work on hard tech, things that are really hard, but with a focus on what can make our planet Earth a better place. He's got a wide range of interests and expertise and passions that range all the way from synthetic biology to semiconductors, I think. And of course, he comes all the way across from the UK with an undergraduate in manufacturing engineering, Cambridge, UK, and then an MBA from Stanford. I think it's gonna be a scintillating conversation. You're gonna be riveted, so let me give you Mark and Manish. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Preeti. I almost didn't recognize the person you're introducing there. I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm, and I'm, I'm rarely introduced with the idea that it'll be a scintillating conversation, talking about semiconductors. My wife likes to tell the story that when we were in graduate school together, she would, uh, when she couldn't sleep at night, she would call me and say, can you please tell me about Moore's Law again so that I can get to sleep? I hope everyone's got a pillow then. That should be a good start for this session. So Manish, first of all, great to be up here with you and thanks for uh, making the time. I'm delighted to be here um, talking. I think we had, as we talked, we'd, we'd thought about a few different topics that, um, in the context of this discussion um, to get us started. You know, semiconductor, four years ago, uh, was not the topic that folks wanted to talk about. Um, and it wasn't one that we actually often thought about. I know that those of us who are serving, uh, in my case, serving clients in semiconductor, you're in semiconductor, we, we didn't get too many people from outside the industry asking about it. That all changed um, in the last few years. Um, a lot of folks wondered, why are we waiting for semiconductors? But um, beneath that, there is uh, a lot going on in the industry that is really, I think, both representative and also the um, almost the, the precursor for some changes we're seeing in manufacturing and in industry globally. Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted that today we're going to talk a little bit about that and understand, I think, from you what, what you experience and also what you're seeing for the future. I, I wanted to start by saying, if you look at semiconductor industry today and, and, and how, how we've seen it evolving, you know, what's been the journey? How did we get to this point? No, I think it's... Um 
it is great to be at a point where my kids actually care about what I do again, uh, or for the first time maybe. Um, uh, you know, I think it's you know instructive. Preeta was saying that you know let's bring Silicon back to Silicon Valley. Well, what happened? What's happened over the last couple of decades um, where you know we went from approximately 40% of the uh, ICs across logic, memory, analog being built in the United States to now you know around 10%. Um, over the two, last two decades, essentially what happened, it wasn't just that semiconductor manufacturers were chasing the lowest labor cost in Asia. It was really that Asian countries all saw the future, saw how um, the future of semiconductors in scaling as we went from 200 millimeter wafers to 300 millimeter wafers, the scale of investment, the scale of infrastructure that would be required was far greater. The minimum efficient scale for a 200 millimeter fab 25 years ago was a billion dollars. The minimum efficient scale around the same time as the industry transitioned to 300 millimeter was five billion. Today, the minimum efficient scale, at least in memory, is 15 to 20 billion for a single FAP. 15 to 20 billion dollars for a single FAP. So you can see the scale of investments was, has been growing throughout the industry um, over the last 20 years. And Asian countries built the infrastructure created a reinforcing ecosystem. They seeded the money with a lot of, seeded the industry with some, uh, initially some you know, funding, but then their, their national champions all grew and it created a reinforcing ecosystem between the educational institutions, between the supply base, the construction base, and the, um, and the, the device manufacturers themselves. And so today, when you look at it and you see that, you know, that, that number of approximately 40% of ICs built in the US, you know, in the, in the 1990s to today, you know, around 10%, it really is a result of, it didn't happen overnight, it didn't happen in the last five years, it happened over 20 years, uh, where really the U.S. just missed the majority of the transition to the 300 millimeter era, and you know, that's why the, the CHIPS Act and the investment tax credits that go along with it are, are so necessary to be able to make sure that we can um, start to bring back manufacturing with leading edge technology at scale uh, here in America. So, Manish, I'm going to pick on that for a moment. So hang on a second, because we're in Silicon Valley. This is the only place in the world that can claim to be called Silicon Valley because it started it. This is where we made chips. This is where the research was done to make the chips. What you just described was a wholesale shift to Asia. So what, say a little bit more about what really caused that. Like, what, what, was, what were the factors that drove that and made that happen? And then why are we... You said a little bit about it, right? This shift, some of the technology shifts and the industrial shifts that that we maybe didn't, that we maybe missed, or we were slower on the United States. But w what else was happening from a research perspective or from a um, market perspective that was causing the historical context there? Well, I think that there was, um, and uh, uh, you know, across many different industries, a, a, a thought process that manufacturing wasn't as valuable. Design was valuable, product many, marketing was valuable, customer management was, or, or channel management was valuable, but the manufacturing in and of itself didn't have value, and that wasn't just a semiconductor industry thing. That was across many, many different industries, right? And of course, couple that with the rise of China and their focus on um, being able to become the, the manufacturing center for the world over the last 20 years to be able to pull their own um, population, you know, uh, out of poverty and into sort of, uh, you know, in, in increase the standard of living that they had, that all kind of played out and that just created a, a you know, a reinforcing loop across multiple different industries. In semiconductors specifically, the, the thing that makes, you know, I mentioned Moore's Law earlier, the thing that makes our industry so exciting to work in, so challenging to work in, is the rate of change, the rate of, the pace of change of our technologies is so rapid, right? Moore's Law, we talk about it, right? Um, unlike anything in any other industry where you're completely retooling a factory every, every 18 to 24 months for a next generation of technology, that doesn't, no other manufacturing technology in the world works like that. And so what, could, what, what many, um, you know, I talk about the 1990s. In the 1990s, TSMC, ASML, even Samsung were all small companies. Samsung just made DRAM then, right? But the rate of change of technology, the ability to invest with scale, and the, and the, the scale that um, the uh, supply base is investing at as well, all allowed Taiwan Semi, ASML, and Samsung 
to become the giants of the industry because of the pace of innovation and the pace of technology. And today, if you think about the reinforcing loop, even within those educational systems and workforce systems, I mean, 20, 30 years ago, nobody would have said Seoul University was in the top 50 in the world. Nobody would have said National University, National University of Singapore. These were not top 50 universities in the world the way for, for engineering and science the way they are today. So there's been a reinforcing loop between the government, between the device ma makers and the suppliers in the ecosystem, and the, uh, the universities and the workforce that have that have led to this, and as I said before, it's not something that happened over five years, it happened over 25 years. It's going to take the U.S. 20 years to be able to re to, to be reestablish that, but certainly at Micron, we're, we're hopeful about doing our part in that. You, you just got to it there, then my next question, which is, what is, so this, this idea of the nation building, the nation building force that really created the, the superpowers of semiconductor today in, in Asia, and now the return to the U.S. for semiconductor, um, and obviously at Micron, and I think you know some of your peers uh, based in the U.S., you'd say you're, I think, not just working alone, but working in concert to actually create um, what should be this 20-year footprint for for the United States and for semiconductor manufacturing in the United States. T tell us a little bit more about um, what's 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 behind making the U.S. not just you know, a leader again in semiconductors, but also competitive and building the ecosystem that's going to make it successful. Sure. So, um, you know, I'll start with Micron, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the things that uh, we view as the comparative advantages for the United States in the long term, in the long arc of our industry. Um, what are some of the advantages the U.S. has? So at Micron, we have kind of leaned into this historic opportunity with the CHIPS Act, with investment tax credits, with the IRA that was announced to be able to um, grow our manufacturing footprint here in the United States. We've announced um, more than $100 billion worth of projects over the next 20 years in Boise, Idaho, where we're headquartered, uh, and also in Syracuse, New York, where we're going to build a mega site, which will be the largest semiconductor manufacturing site in the history of the country. Um, between those, there'll be uh, five individual clean rooms, and I mentioned each clean room is 15 to 20 billion dollars. By the time we get to the end of this, it may be even more. So we'll be, um, you know, 100 to 120 billion dollars worth of investment in uh, advanced uh, memory over that time. Um, the first thing we have to have, I think, everyone in, in you know, in. Uh, in our industry needs to have is leading edge technology, which certainly that's the, that's the bedrock. And unfortunately, Micron has been able to get to industry leadership, both in DRAM and NAND. We're now, you know, nine to 12 months ahead of our Korean competitors or our Japanese competitors in, in terms of technology capability for both DRAM and NAND. And so being able to maintain that technology leadership certainly is, is, a, is a bedrock for us to be able to invest in manufacturing. Um, but then the other thing we need is scale. We absolutely need to invest at large scale because of the, the memory industry is very cost sensitive. So one fab alone isn't cost eff effective. You need to have the co-location of, of clusters of fabs. Um, and that's why the New York project that's announced is so large. And then the, the, the last thing that we need is an ecosystem to be able to you know, lower the cost of construction, lower the cost of maintaining and, and running the facilities, as well as lowering the cost of materials and the, the service and the engineering for the equipment that we have. And so we definitely look forward to partnering with others who are going to be bringing large-scale manufacturing projects to the U.S. across the board to be able to build up the supply chain and the, and the ecosystem to be able to support large-scale semiconductor manufacturing. Now, in terms of the comparative advantage, what do we see? Why are we seeing this? And um, you know, it, when you think about the long, uh, long-range trajectory of the history, one of the um, key factors in terms of labor cost is labor inflation. So obviously today we may say that Asian countries have lower labor costs, but in all of the advanced Asian economies, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, China, there's declining population growth, right? Negative population growth. So over the long arc, you expect to see higher labor inflation in those regions. U.S. fortunately, and if we're able to maintain uh, reasonable immigration policy, should have population growth. And this will allow, we think, there to be a, a closure, maybe not a complete closure, but a, a starting to close the labor cost gap, whether at the engineering level, whether at the technician level, or at the service level. Um, second thing is obviously semiconductor uh, manufacturing is incredibly power intensive. We definitely believe that the um, 
uh, that uh, the United States has both the lowest cost energy supply in the world, but also the best prospects for low cost clean energy. We've made a commitment for net zero by 2050. Everyone wants to see the, the you know, climate change impacts ideally reversed, if not at least attenuated. Um, and so as you think about 2040, 2050, where are you going to get low cost, high availability of, of uh, clean energy, United States is definitely tops on that list. So these are some of the things that are driving the long arc of us being able to be competitive. That's, that's super. What's the personal challenge for you in managing through all this? Is there one? You have sites that are global all over the world. That's part of the competitive advantage, I imagine, of Micron, as you said, in, relative to your competitors. What, what does that translate to for you in, in leading that organization? I know it's a, it's a completely different challenge. We've sort of gotten used to, I think, as an industry, you know, um, my kids are used to, I'm never, dad's never home for dinner because all I ever do is when I'm in California, I'm working with Asia um, for my whole career. And now being able to try and, it's, it's exciting to be able to bring some of that, you know, ca manufacturing capability and manufacturing presence back into, into our region. And I think it's, it's you know, really re-engaging ourselves within the workforce uh, development at all levels, right? At the scientist's level, at the engineering level, at the apprentice and technician level, skilled trades, at the construction level. All of these are areas that we're re-engaging to be able to invest to build the workforce that we're gonna need for the future. Um, we're engaging with the, uh, and, and that's why we've announced a partnership with the National Science Foundation, where we're going to be, uh, um, you know, investing $10 million to be able to, over the next few years, not just in leading edge semiconductor research, which is where most of, you know, historically we would think that's where the NSF money goes, but in um, STEM curriculum, semiconductor specific curriculum at four year institutions, but also at two year institutions and apprenticeship training to be able to bring more people into the construction workforce. Secretary Raimondo talks about we need more women in construction, we need more women in manufacturing workforce. We need to access a larger part of that population in order to make sure the that we can be cost effective. Um, so these are some of the things and then I think, you know, uh, there's certainly a lot I think we're going to talk a little bit more about in the future on smart manufacturing, and artificial intelligence and how we use that to be able to help close the gap. You can implement smart manufacturing and AI everywhere, but obviously the higher cost regions have the most to gain from those implementations and Micron has been leading in that as well. This, this theme of education I think is such a huge one when we, when you look at students who are, or high school students who are making decisions about what they're going to go do at school and how they're going to think about the workforce, we know Semiconductor had lost its shine in the last 20 years, for, partly for all the reasons we just described, but also because there were, as we all know, very attractive other opportunities that they got excited about. And if you were going to you know, make, make your name in the world, it wasn't necessarily going to be in Semiconductor. I think one of the exciting things that you're talking about is the investments that the government are making, that educational institutions are making, that the industry is making, that are not only going to draw folks back into semiconductor, but also the different disciplines that are going to be necessary. It's not just EE and material science anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, it's m m many, many more disciplines, and you're right. I, um, you know, when I was at MIT, um, the electrical engineering and computer science departments were about 50 50, and, you know, today Ananta talks about how it's 10 to 1, you know, computer science to electrical engineering. Um, and so we definitely have to recruit more, more students back into the hard sciences, electrical engineering, material science, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, um, and yes, growing areas in data science, mathematics to be able to run these fabs. I mean, the, the fabs today are completely automated. No one touches a wafer, but you don't even have to go into the clean room anymore. Right, so it's really, I mean, we, we have these operating con operational control centers where we're running every single wafer, every single process, scheduling, sequencing, all of that is done through a, a NASA Houston-like control center where we have all of our engineers, all of our, you know, all of our management um, happens through there, which actually means it's a lot more like playing a video game, which, you know, is what the, you know, kids in college these days are more used to, to be able to manage a large scale manufacturing operation. And we need to be able to get tap into some of those skills as well to be able to optimize the efficiency of the facilities, improve our yields, et cetera. So Mark, I wanted to turn around and, you know, Mark, you advise not just, you know, um, uh, Micron or semiconductor clients, but you advise clients across a number of different manufacturing uh, industries. And so, yeah, you know, semiconductor may be the tip of the sphere 
But, but what are some of the, the trends that either that I mentioned or that you're seeing that are, um, you know, able to, you know, are going to have impact in other industries, you know, with regard to U.S. or North American manufacturing? I said it earlier, this idea that semiconductor is the tip of the spear um, in terms of this resurgence of manufacturing for North America is, a, is an exciting, I think it's an exciting time and an exciting proposition. The themes that are driving the semiconductor industry back to the US or, or that we're catalyzing upon in order to build the US semiconductor um, uh, ecosystem back up again, some of them are specific to the sector. You described kind of the history and the arc here a little bit in semiconductor. But, but I think three of them at least are really transferable and we're seeing it else, elsewhere in other sectors. One at the just fundamental level of economics is what you, what you alluded to, the normalization and the, essentially the global flattening in terms of the wage dis, dis, disparity and the fact that we're seeing both wage inflation in the countries that historically have had the lowest cost of production from a late labor pool perspective. And we're seeing the standards of living have risen for almost everybody globally to a point that when we talk about that combined with the high levels of automation, the labor cost is no longer the uniform driver of where to place manufacturing. There's a second theme, um, which we're all experiencing at some level, and I think all have our eyes on very closely, which is, there is a rebalancing from a trade perspective. Now, is that only due to the geopolitical rebalancing? No, it's also because we have nations, you know, China, Indonesia, Malaysia, all of these have come to a point where their economies are also shifting towards a combination of manufacturing and service employment. And the balance of their own trade is also shifting with it. Um, and as a result, U.S. manufacturing not only looks more competitive domestically, it also looks more competitive globally. And I think that's another factor that we're going to see play out. And then the third one, I don't think these three are uniquely the, all the factors, but the third one that I would like to highlight, um, and you mentioned it in the context of semiconductor, is this broad theme about what I'll call the... Historically, we talked about non-market forces. We said things, you know, regulatory forces, environmental forces, these are non-market. Well, environmental forces are no longer non-market forces. Um, whether it's an actual or an implicit cost of carbon in the business in terms of the source of your energy, I think you were talking about in, in terms of access to green energy, or whether it's because of the carbon intensity of the processes that you employ or the, or the place that you choose to locate, that is now a, a, a force. And I, I think in semiconductor you see this, right? Most of your customers have committed to net zero targets. Um, when we talk about the hyperscalers, we talk about the Facebooks and the, the Metas and the um, Apples of the world, they all have a meaningful net zero target that they're going to look to the semiconductor industry and, and every other player in their supply chain to deliver against. That is a real force. Um, and the choice of where you locate is not just about access to renewable energy, it's about the broader set of practices that you have from an ESG and particularly from a carbon perspective. So just to recap, I would say, one, one, just a rebalancing in terms of labor and access to labor and labor and the cost of labor, two, and, and combined with the level of automation, two, the rebalancing of trade broadly, and then three, this theme around decarbonization and sustainability. Yeah. And any particular industries beyond semiconductor you think that you know, could be uh, the next to, to come back or to be you know, taking advantage of these factors? You know, I think we see it more broadly across the electronics value chain. Um, that we, whether it's North America or whether it's broader and, you know, we see it shifting into Latin America and Mexico and, and locations, that's already happening um, across the electronics value chain. Um, again, a little bit in the short term motivated by the geopolitical forces, but I, I think longer term it's going to be rational economic forces that drive it. Uh, and I would say also what we, what we talk about as advanced industries, what I mean by that is relatively high value, complex, sometimes capital intensive manufacturing processes as well. Um, aerospace, automotive's got its own regional dynamic, but automotive, at least tier two, tier th you know, tier two, the more electronics content into that, that's another category I think we'll see as well. So, you know, we have a lot, well, about five minutes left, and one of the things we wanted to talk about a little bit, given that there's a generative AI session this afternoon, and there's a lot of, I'm sure, entrepreneurial interest in understanding how AI has an impact on manufacturing, um, uh, 
maybe we can just uh, spend a few minutes. What, what are some of the trends you're seeing? And then I can talk a little bit about Micron as well. Yeah, I would love to talk to hear your perspectives from a smart manufacturing perspective view. I think it's impossible to talk about anything without talking about AI, right? We'd be highly unfashionable if we didn't. <laughs> so we have to start a little bit there. But the themes around um, smart manufacturing, at least as, as, as McKinsey, as we've looked across clients and across sectors, um, and we've surveyed what are the major enablers for smart manufacturing, right? And think about that in terms of productivity and, 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 um, and, and quality. AI is one of the top four. The other is the workforce. You alluded to it, but it's the transition and the shift in the talent base. That's one of the other bigger, big, big factors. Um, and another one is also just the um, inclination towards um, a data-driven and data, data-driven approach to performance management. And that sounds like it's part of partly AI, but it's also a very human aspect to it as well, right? Are, do you have a workforce that naturally looks to the data as a way to manage the business in, at a level that was beyond what was possible before? Those are the three big enablers we see for smart manufacturing, at least. Yeah, and I think, you know, similarly, you know, when I always talk about manufacturing, I talk about the things that really matter are variability management, variability reduction, cycle time reduction, and throughput optimization, right? These are the things that effectively, the triangle together that drives manufacturing excellence. And um, whether we're talking about adding image sensors across our facilities, or whether we're pulling signals off of all of our equipment to be able to, to um, detect when the, the processes may be uh, drifting or when maintenance is gonna be due, predict maintenance uh, time periods. Um, or whether it's trying to det detect the sources of variation to be able to improve yield, um, tighten the process margin on a given tool to be able to improve yield on a, on a core process, or being able to recognize that I have more ability to run a tool at a higher throughput, which can then improve, improve throughput of the facility or reduce capital cost of the facility. You know, whether it's the, 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 I mean, the number of sensors, the signals, and the ability to process that, it's no longer um, every single engineer sitting at their desk with a copy of Jump doing a Nova on their own to be able to make a recommendation three, two, three days later. It's an automated system that takes all of this in and, and, and is, is real-time um, interdicting into the process or is making recommendations um, by itself that, that engineers then validate. It, it, it's really flipping the scientific process on its head, right? Instead of starting with a hypothesis, gathering data, and then going off and trying to conclude and make recommendations, we flip it on its head and we, we start with the data. We have these objectives that we're trying to optimize for, many of which you just mentioned, right? And then being able to, uh, to react to those and be able to implement it. It takes a different uh, skill set in the workforce. We all grew up in an era where we learned the scientific method. We learned first principles of, of science and engineering. And the, you know, the kids coming out today have a totally different approach to being able to start with data and be able to draw conclusions from it without you know, all the data scientists we hire. They're like, yeah, I don't need to learn about device physics. I don't care. Just give me the data, and I'll tell you something interesting. And we all, we all are transitioning, and we're seeing tremendous, tremendous benefit from that um, in terms of the, the rate of uh, yield learning ramps, the productivity improvements, the ability to manage equipment cost effectively, all of those things. I, I, know, I know we're almost out of time, Manish. So how far does it go? Does, is, is AI going to solve design of chips, translation of that into manufacturing, running the manufacturing operations, conducting the commercial activities? Where, 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 where is a business are you planning for it, and how are you planning for it? So absolutely, we are thinking that it's going to have impacts in all of those areas. I don't know that you're talking about complete replacement in any of those areas, but there will be impacts in all of those areas. And, uh, and we're planning for it in ways where we can safely and securely manage it in a way we can protect our IP. Um, that certainly is, a, is critical. Uh, in our business, IP is our, you know, is our lifeblood. So we have to be able to, to do this in a way where we can utilize all of the learning. A company like Micron with um, 50,000 patents and you know, 40,000 employees around the world. There's a, there's a huge amount of data we generate on our own, whether it's in design or in technology or in process manufacturing. And so we, we, we can utilize something within our four walls. We also can try to utilize things outside in a secure and safe way to be able to accelerate coding or to be able to you know, detect trends that are going on outside and be able to, to automate. Um, but I think you're going to see impacts everywhere. I don't know that it, there'll be complete replacement anywhere. But um, you know, it's still early, and, and uh, you know, we'll see. Good. I th Thanks, Mark. Thank you, this. Manish. <laughs> Appreciate Thank everybody you. for, uh, for uh, uh, the time. Thanks. Thank you.